had a, a thought this morning. Anybody work out here? Okay, anybody like really work out? Not like you work out in your mind, but like you actually make it to the gym. How many know there's people that like they, they work out here, but they don't actually ever make it to the gym? I've been there. I had this, this thought this morning before I open up, and I realized that working out without eating right is pointless. Only the people that work out amen that, right? I want you to understand, those of you who eat garbage and you run on the treadmill, that doesn't actually do anything but make you feel better about what you ate. But it doesn't actually change you, right? I realize that working out and not eating well, like working and not eating well is pointless because these two go hand in hand, right? Because if all you do, check this out, our lives, when, when we... When we work out, if all you're doing is doing the outside repetitions, but what you're putting in is garbage, there's going to be no result. And a lot of times what happens is when you're putting in, when you're putting in, uh, can we just close those glass doors? That'd be, I think that might be my kid. Maybe it's not. Never mind. <laughs> I, I realize this, right? When you, when you create repetitions on the outside, but you're constantly putting in garbage, it works against each other. This is why eating junk and working out cannot coexist together eventually you're going to have to choose one or the other. And I feel like that this morning with our Christian walks. You're eventually going to have to choose if you're going to let the repetition also dictate what you put in. Because what you put in will come out. Right? We talked about last week about wounds and how we can't, God doesn't want to coexist with our wounds. He wants to heal our wounds. And this morning I wanted to share on this simple phrase of superficiality. Super quiet in here, right? How many of you are real Lakers fans? Raise your hands. You are diehard. No, before Kobe died. No, I want, I want to go there. I do want to go there. Because everybody's a Lakers fan now. Right? How many of you notice that? Like you got people that are like, oh, Kobe, rest in peace. I love you. Lakers for life. You're like, bro, you don't even watch that one game. Anybody ever met people like that? Or how many, like, all of a sudden, you Niners fan, right? I mean, you've been hidden for like 20 years, but all of a sudden they start getting some wins and now you're a fan, right? Literally, I mean, there, I mean again, I, I appreciate people that are like, I don't know nothing about basketball, just bless the Bryant family, right? But it's the other people that act like they've been watching the NBA for life. And they've been diehard, right? Like Nipsey Hussle, when he passed away, God rest his soul too, right? All of a sudden, everybody was a Nipsey listener. And you're like, I know you've never heard one song from Nipsey, right? It's this superficial culture, especially that's embedded in Los Angeles. We are in one of the capitals of superficial. We are literally in the, in, we are in the heart of superficiality. Right? Most people can care less about what's on the inside as long as everything on the outside looks good. But here's the crazy thing is superficiality is the curse of our generation. And what people do is they build superficiality as a fortress, not realizing they're actually building their tomb. They're actually building something that's going to lead them to death because superficiality is a wall that keeps both people and God out. It really is. It really is. And it's what you hide behind when you're afraid of people actually getting to know you. Now, I learned that superficiality, right? Check this out. Superficiality comes not when you feel guilty, but when you feel shame. Can I hit on this real quick? Superficiality comes, can, can I grab your attention? Superficiality comes not when you feel guilty, but when you feel shame. See, guilt is when you feel bad for something you've done. Right? How many of you have ever done something bad and you felt bad for it? Come on. If you don't feel bad for it, God help you. Okay? You've lost your conviction, man. You lose your conviction. I don't know what else there is to lose. Superficiality, I mean, superficiality right, it stems from this. When, I, when I'm guilty, I feel bad for the mistake I made. When I have shame, I believe I am the mistake. Do you see the difference? Guilt and shame. Guilt is I'm sorry for the mistake I made. Shame is I am the mistake. For so many years, I grew up thinking I was the very mistaken reason why my parents got divorced, right? I never could separate. This is why you got to understand the Bible says that godly sorrow leads you to repentance, right? And true repentance, this word in the Greek is too so. True repentance is where you turn to 180 turn from something unto something. This is where you hear this word repent. Maybe you've heard it in churches before. 
True biblical repentance always lands you in the place of joy because you trade that which is old for that which is new. Now, I, I love shoes. I don't know if anybody here likes shoes, right? I don't know if there's any shoe heads in here, sneaker heads in here, right? If I were to come to you and you had some sketchers, no offense on sketchers, maybe they're going to make a comeback. I don't know. There's, some of them are getting fresh now, yeah. If I came to you and I had some Yeezys, right? If I was to say, hey, I want to give you my shoes. You give me those $30 sketchers. I'll give you my shoes instantly. You take them off. This is a picture, I believe, of repentance. Repentance is always joyful, right? But superficiality never lets you repent because it tells you that you're always right. Superficiality is the very wall that only you can knock down from the inside out. God can't knock it down from the outside in because he didn't build it. You did. You built a perfect version of you. Social media has done this to our culture. I'm guilty of that. Right? Now I'm a 90s kid, so we didn't get social media until a little bit later in our lives. I was born in 1990. Right? When I was young, we rode bikes. We played tag, heads up, seven up, threw dirt claws at each other. I had a super soaker. Nowadays, they would try to take those away. Some of you got that anyways. Rather, you're a gangbanger hiding behind a gun, or you're a person in church hiding behind your religion superficiality is found in all facets of life all facets you find it right superficiality is not allowing yourself to fully be seen for fear that you won't fully be loved this is why when i get people that are like i just love this guy girls right they'll come to me i just love him so much he's so cute this guy's like yo b like a man really like her right i'm like cool why don't you just like be friends for a year like see each other in all seasons because how many of you know that, ladies, a dude can fake it for two months? He can. You're going to get the, he's going to take you on dates. It's going to be sweet. It's going to be kind. Men, she can fake it for probably six months, right? You're like, that fart came out of you? Like, you waited, six, like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just saying, can we get honest here? People, we can fake it. For months, but it's very difficult. Eventually, in years to come, the real us comes out. The real us comes out. And even in church, we hide behind posts, comments, filters, good works, by how all the ministry that we do. And by no means am I saying don't serve, right? I'm not saying, you know, don't ever serve in ministry, right? No, no, no. What I am saying is this. Don't let the serving that you do for God be the excuse of not having any intimacy or being known, right? We've mastered keeping people and God at an arm's length. Not letting it, listen, check this out. I, this is a cool phrase, man. I just want to really hit on this. We let people close enough so we can claim community, but not close enough to have true biblical fellowship. Let me repeat that. We let people close enough to claim community. Well, yeah, this is my community. No, it's not. No one knows you. Just because you show, this is, this is my number one problem, I feel like, with like, people that are just churchgoers. You can't think that because you show up once a week at a service, it does service. Attend your family once a week and see how close you'd be. Attend your boyfriend or your girlfriend once a week and see how close you'd be. Attend your marriage once a week, see how close you'd be for, two, for an hour and a half. And even in that hour and a half, it's so strong. You know, we've all been to church before. Like you get in a big argument right before you get there, then once you get out the car, hey, God is good. And all the time and all the time, God is good, right? We get there, we blend in with the crowd. Everyone else is worshiping, so you just kind of blend in and hide behind their fire, right? You kind of hide behind what they're doing. You hear the message. You maybe throw some money in a giving bucket to feel better about yourself, and you leave, and we call it church. Uh-uh. There's act that, that's act we've, we've, we've accepted in America superficiality, and it's come because we, in this country, there's, there's, no, there's no real persecution for our faith. Like, when you get saved in America, you get congratulated and you get a welcome card. When you get saved in other countries, you're like, hey, welcome to the faith. Man, you might be beheaded tomorrow. There's a cost for your faith. In America, there's no cost for your faith. Right? The cost is, man, I drew, well, at least I drove out there on Monday. That was a big inconvenience. Like, no, there's more. My prayer is 2020, we start living not superficial lives, but supernatural lives. Like these men did in the Bible. Now check this out. From the beginning of time, God designed us to be known and to know him. But where did superficiality come in? 
Like, where did it biblically come in? I was thinking about this. The first place that I see a picture of people trying to hide from God and only let them see what they want him to see is Adam. You think that superficiality was invented in Los Angeles. It was invented in the garden. Check this out. It's wild because the scripture I'm going to read, I don't really hear this read in a lot of churches. I don't really hear this scripture preached a ton, but I want to read it to you. It's Genesis 3. Here's what it says. Then the eyes of both of them were open, Adam and Eve, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So check this out. They started to cover the areas of their life they were embarrassed about because they knew now God could see. This is a human nature. When there's something you're embarrassed about, you cover it. Right? When there's something you feel shame about, you cover it. Not understanding that God already sees and knows it. This is the next verse. It says this. They heard the sound of the Lord, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is why I love the AC. In the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, check this out, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So check this out. They first covered themselves because they were embarrassed. But when you cover yourself so much and try to keep people out, it actually draws you out of the presence of God. This is why most, you know, you ever meet someone like everyone else is encountering God and they're just standing there and they can't feel a thing? Because superficiality will take you out of God's presence. Because you're trying to give God the best version of you instead of giving him the real you. You're trying to give God the best version of who you think he wants to see. How many have ever done that before? Come on, we've all done that, right? I promise you, if, when, how many of you are not married here? Raise your hand, not married. Okay, one day you're going to go and you're going to meet the in-laws. How many know the first meeting of the in-laws is the most terrifying? It is. You, you get, I mean, you get, every other day you wear sweats, but that day you wear slacks. You wear hats every day, that day you buy moose. Does anyone wear moose anymore? Gel. My father wore more moose. Right? You don't own a thing of cologne, but that day at Target, you're so cheap, you just go to the axe aisle. Shh. I know you've all done it before. Gio, I know you've done it. Remember gym class? Come on, y'all remember after gym? Shh. Right? Hope you didn't put it on your skin. Not good for you. We've all, that's one of the most main points where you will be super, you, you come and you want to give your best. You want to bring your best. I mean, these are going to be your future in-laws. These, these could be the potential people you have to see for the rest of your life. I remember when I first had dinner with Marcella's parents to ask her to, to marry me. The, you know, I, I brought all the, you know, I brought like a, a contract and I, I did all these things to impress them. And then at the end, they're like, how would you financially support her? I'm like, I haven't thought that far, but, but I love her. You know, it's like. We want to cover our bases. They heard the Lord was coming, and because they had covered themselves, they had created superficiality. It eventually took them out of the presence of God. Superficiality is one of the big indicators, in my opinion, for not experiencing God. When you have people in a room, I meet a lot of people in a room, they're like, the room's erupting, God's encountering people, people are weeping. And I'm not saying that this is the only reason why. There may be other things you're going through. But I would, I would dare to say that a lot of times when we cannot feel God's presence, you've got to ask yourself, what superficial barriers have I built? And this is what it says. Then the Lord called to man and said to him, where are you? Next verse. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself. Now, what's interesting about this is what drove Adam to run from God wasn't his bareness. It wasn't that he felt naked. I'm not saying for you to experience God's presence, you've got to walk around butt naked. That's not what I'm saying. Like, I just want to experience the fullness of Adam. No, like, <laughs> please. <laughs> it's you and your wifey or your husband, okay? But check this out it says this that he. He was afraid. So what drove superficiality in, in Adam? It wasn't that he was embarrassed. It was that he was afraid. Check this out. Fear came into the storyline at the fall of man and is still interwoven in the storyline of many of you in this room. 
Fear is what's interwoven and causes you to build this facade of a good version of you. Yes? Before the fall, Adam had 100% confidence in God, 100% confidence in his relationship with God. He doesn't for one second guess his relationship with God, right? He walks fully seen, I mean, in, in every aspect, right? He walks fully seen by God, never once questioning it. Never once. But the moment fear creeps in, instantly he builds facades. And right after the fall, check this out, right after the fall, they eat the fruit, Adam feels the need to now cover up what he feels ashamed about. And for the first time in history, he tries to hide from God. Man, I, 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 you know, I, it's, it's crazy. I, I have the opportunity to travel a lot. I was just in Boston this weekend, and I, I'm, I'm, this, this year I'll be in, in Brazil. I'll be in Asia, South Africa. I mean, there's a lot of places throughout the U.S., and I go to a lot of different communities and churches and, and places. And what, what's always a good indication to me about people who know God, right? When you ever think, like, how do you judge if someone knows the Lord? Well, you actually can tell if, if someone knows the Lord. And it's not by the way they dance. It's not by the way they sing. It's by the way they speak of his nature. Right? Because you can learn rhythm. You can learn repetition. You can learn when to stand, when to sit. You could know when to shout. Right? You're like, oh, Brandon said, whenever he says this, we'll shout. Right? You can learn repetition. But when you meet someone that knows the nature of God, there is something deeper about the way they encounter and experience and speak of God. And you can really tell by someone who knows God's nature by the way they speak of him. I heard Corey Russell say this once. He said, if I was to take away all of your Christianese words, holy, alpha, and, you know, all the words that describe God, how would you describe him? If you couldn't say, he's wonderful. No, take that out. He's holy. Right? That, if, you, if some of you were singing these words on here, you're probably even like, what does this mean? The lamb on the throne. Like, is there like a band? Like, there's not like a literal lamb. Like, if you don't know, it's because you don't have context yet. You, you got to, like, you got to, like, you got to, we'll, we'll break it down later. But you know what I'm saying? Like, like, we have to get to a place where we understand his nature and his character. Right? Adam got to a place where fear crept in, caused him to want to hide. And what's crazy is he hid among the things that God had created. He took his fig leaves that he created, hid in his trees, and thought, huh, this is a great idea. He already seen. He no longer wanted God to see certain areas, right? And thousands of years later, we still have a generation sowing on fig leaves. We still have a culture today that wants to say, God, you can see this part of my life and this part of my life, in this part of my life, but you cannot see this part. Like, I really don't want you to know this. I mean, this part, like, it's pretty gnarly. Like, I, I don't know. Like, if you're, maybe you're really not going to love me. Like, I think you're going to love me. And it's all stemmed in this fear of will I be loved. Would, would you, do you agree? And have you ever seen that in your life? And it's sad because it continues throughout today. And many years as a believer, right, the once vulnerable people that accepted Jesus and received him so humbly, right, begin to actually start to think that God wants to just save the best version of you. So we get saved by grace, right? We know that God encounters us. And then over time when we make mistakes, because it's easy to believe that God forgives the mistakes you make before you're saved, yeah. right? Is that not easy? Yeah. Like that's where most people start and stop their testimony. Yeah. Nobody? Man, y'all are angels. <laughs> wow. I'm in the heavenly host right now. Most people start and stop their testimony before Christ because the sins and the area of failures we have after him are much more embarrassing because we think we ought to know. I should have known better. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have spoke like that. And then we have the other people that come, yeah, you have, you've read the Bible, right? You're like, man, I just started. Like, I haven't read the whole thing yet. It's crazy. And we, it's crazy because we have grace for the sinner coming to the faith, but we lose grace for the saint. We lose grace for the one that's learning. The Bible says to walk out your salvation, right? Like I said last week, like just because I became, just because I accepted Jesus doesn't mean that God downloaded the Bible app into my mind. 
And all of a sudden, I, like, I mean, when I, like my wife would say, like, when I would, when I would have a rough time, maybe, like, in our marriage, you know, maybe I didn't, like, love her as, as I should have, or I wasn't as kind. She'd be like, well, don't you know you're a Christian? And I'm like, yeah, I'm a Christian, but, like, I don't know calculus, you know? Like, just because I became a Christian, it's not like God downloaded, like, math and they downloaded history. Like, there's still natural things that I have to obtain. Wives and husbands, can I speak to you for a moment in the room? This is why you have to have grace with one another. You can't treat your spouse how you think God is treating you. Where he forgives all the things before, right? But after, I don't think he forgives this. He doesn't want the best version of you. Adam wanted God to see the areas he felt proud of, but not the areas he was ashamed in. And what is a superficial person like? A superficial person is someone who is all about the surface and the appearances. And looking at it, that superficiality comes through the door of fear. Okay? I'm going to be finishing soon. Now, my father and grandfather, right? So me and my wife are in the process right now. We're actually going to be going to be getting a home soon. We're, we're it's man, it's been a an amazing journey. Um, I remember when I moved to LA, uh, I had one hundred and fifty dollars a month. And that was a baller back then, right? I think I couldn't even afford air in LA. Um, and so in this process, um, I'm having to actually reach out to my family, and I've noticed something about me and my grandpa and my father because we're all Barcelona men. The natural curse of the Barcelona men is to be the most superficial that I've ever seen. I mean, me and, if, if, if me and my grandpa and dad, if you were to compare our relationship to a pool, we literally swim in a kiddie pool. That's how deep our relationship goes. Kiddie pool. It's not deep. You can't dive in it. Maybe some of you could relate to that. Like, literally, it was my grandpa's birthday, it's, and, it's, and, and, and I know they want to go deep. They just don't know how, right? My grandpa's birthday the other day, and I'm like, hey, grandpa, happy birthday. Hey, uh, how are you, right? Like, it, I could tell he kind of he wants to engage a little bit. I'm like, I'm good, I'm good. How are you? Good, good, good. How old are you? Old enough to vote. You know, like, he does these little jokes to kind of, he wants to, like, he wants to, like, detour me from, I mean, one time I went out with my dad, and, and we went out to go eat, you know, and. And we were in the car, and it's like awkward. We're just driving. Hey, Dad. Hey. How are you? All right. He never says good. He says all right. That's a Barcelona thing. I'm all right. Cool. So how's, how's everything been like with, with Araceli, your wife? And It's all right. Matt, I, have a, I have a little brother. He's like seven years old. How's, how's Max been? He's all right. Everything's all right, you know. We've, there's a superficiality within the Barcelona. You know what's even scarier is when that bleeds into marriage. Is when that bleeds into your relationships with people. How about this, when it bleeds into your relationship with God? There's this quote I wanted to read you. If I could get everyone's attention, unless you're taking notes, I, want to, I do want to ask you, just put your phones down for a moment. Those who text, listen up. This is for you. To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. To be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from the pretense. It humbles us out of our self-righteousness. You know it is humbling when someone can love the real you? How many of you have ever been a mess? I'll raise your hand for some of you. I'm like, you need your hand up. You need three foot up everything. Right? Isn't it humbling when you are a mess and people just come alongside you and hug you? Don't you want to punch them? Like, get away from me. Because everyone else in your life didn't do that. I remember I lived with this family once, um, um, Chris and Neva Cox. They were an amazing family, and they were, like a, they were a host home. So when I was younger, when I was 17 years old, my stepfather left my mom and, my, and me and my siblings. He left us three days before Christmas. My, he, he was the one who worked. My mom didn't have a job for like 12 or 13 years. So left us with no money. Um, and they shut off our heat in the middle of winter. So we're taking, like, cold shower. It was miserable. He literally, like, loaded up his stuff. This is what, like, this is where the decline of my sister's life started, if you know my sister's story. So he, he literally goes up to my sister and says, I have a surprise for you, loads his bags and leaves. 
I mean, just terrible, right? And so my mom comes up to me a few weeks later and says, hey, I just want to let you know. I'm 17, right? I just gotten saved at 16. She goes, hey, I want you to know that, that I love you, but I can't afford you anymore. Like, I'm going to have to move in with your aunt, and we're going to move me, Zalia, and Ian into one bedroom, and I don't know what to do with you. So you have to find somewhere to live. Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, so I'm, I'm really, like, I'm really scared. I mean, I'm 17, but I have God, right? And I don't really have much to lose. I had a 1990 Acura, so it wasn't like I had a big inheritance. Um, <laughs> but I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. So I go to church that day, right? And or that night, it's like a Wednesday night. And I used to lead worship back in the day, uh, playing some hill song, Lead Me to the Cross, you know what I'm talking about? So <laughs> lead me to the cross. So I was... I'm leading that night, and one of my biggest pet peeves, if you know me, is when people don't engage. It's just a pet peeve I have. It's one of my pet peeves. When, I'm going to say this. When believers don't engage, when believers are on their phones, when believers are talking, whether it's the word or it's worship, here's why. When I got saved, I got radically changed. I was, I was an atheist. I was addicted to certain things. I was depressed. I remember dumping pills in my hands. Like, my life was jacked. I was in anger management. I'm, gonna, I'm not proud of this, but I used to, like, sit in corners of the room and just, like, rock and scream. Like, I was, like, tormented as a kid. I don't do that no more, okay? <laughs> Good. It's been many years, right? And I would be, like, in this corner, God! And my mom's like, you need anger management. No, I don't, you know? I was, I, was, I was tormented as a child. I was fearful of everything. I mean, you know, when you grew up in the abuse that I grew up in and you've seen your, 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 you know, your father and you see all these things going on, it, it messes with you here because your family is supposed to be the most stable thing that, that holds you together. But when your family is embedded in abuse, it naturally creates an instability in you for the rest of your life that if you're not healed for, you will. Re you know that you're not going to not become like your father by not trying to become your father? You're not going to become your father when you tr go after becoming like Jesus. It's not like, well, I'm not going to be like my dad just for the sake of not being like, no, you will become what you hate. And hopefully you hate what you've become and you change. But I'm going through all this, this craziness, right? All this wildness as a kid. And I, and I learned from this young age to, to build these walls. There is such a fear in me of being known. Let me finish this. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness. It fortifies us from any difficulty life can throw at us, says Tim Keller. Do you realize that when you embrace what God's doing, and in your weakness, you put down the superficiality, you actually allow yourself to stop believing lies that are thrown at you, and you start believing truth. And check this out. From a young age, we're taught to put on a performance for what people want to see. How many remember high school? Anybody remember high school? Like freshman year, you're a gangbanger. <laughs> Sophomore year, you're a skater. <laughs> Junior year, I don't know what you are. Jock, senior year, you don't care. Come on, how many, could be honest, how many of you had phases in high school, right? Or maybe you were like, I was gangbanger freshman year and deeper gangbanger and then deeper gangbanger, right? But everyone, man, I, I had so many different versions of Brian in high school because I was trying to find my crowd. I mean, I thought, finally my senior year, I just embraced my guitar. I'm like, this is who I am. I'm, a, I'm John Mayer's son, you know, like, I'm gonna play Y Georgia, <clears throat> I'm gonna solo. I, I'm an, I, I, and I, literally, that's how I got through my senior year. I mean, I was a Christian already, but I had this gift of music that even if you didn't like me, you liked my gift. This is what made me accepted by so many people. I was liked by the jocks. I was liked by the gangsters. I was liked by the cheerleaders. Everyone liked me because I was just that cool kid who played guitar, right? But I had these different phases. But eventually, you cast off the superficiality that you once learned to adapt only to survive, and the curse, check this out, the curse is that we spend a lifetime with people knowing the outskirt versions of you. But the even greater curse is we spend a lifetime only knowing the outskirts of God. You know, I heard Mike Bickle say this, and I loved it. Because a lot of times we justify, right, if we feel, if we feel like we're a little bit, you know, deep, deeper in our, in our relationship with God, it's easy to justify when we look at someone who's a little bit more shallower than we are. Even if our depth is only an inch deeper than our neighbor. So maybe I look at someone else and I'm like, well, I'm an inch deeper than him. 
Just because I'm an inch deeper than that guy.